Kassler Skidsit Architects, an Oslo-based architectural studio that was started in 2015 by Amandine Kassler and Erlen Skidsit. And the studio works very much uh, focusedly um, on existing buildings and heritage environments, mostly in Norway and the United Kingdom. So what is interesting, and I hope we will be hearing more from them today on this, is this idea of engaging with alternative forms of preservation, which uses existing natural, historical, and social qualities of a place to shape their design practice. So without further ado, I would like to introduce you to uh, Amandine Kassler and Erlen Skieset. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, great. Perfectly. Yeah, great. Very well. Okay, so thank you. Thank you. Um, um, so I am Alan Sheset. Um, well done for uh, pronouncing my name, Vera. That was quite impressive. Robert was Lesso. Very Lesso. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I am one half of Kassler Sheset Architects. Um, my partner, Amandine, uh, is home with our six month old baby. She might pop up on the screen at some point, uh, depending on how how loud our daughter is today with uh, she has discovered her voice. So let's see. Um, yes, so um, we are a small practice based in Oslo and uh, I cannot think of a bigger contrast than, than what we have just seen from Bahrain. Um, I'm looking out the window now and uh, we have a sunrise just about starting. So um, it's cold, it's dark and uh, timber buildings. It's a whole different uh, ball game, but um, I'm very happy to show you what we are doing. And uh, let me see if I can share the screen. <clears throat> okay, can you see the screen? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. Um, okay, I will start. Um, I can hear someone talking in the background, but um, maybe yes, someone needs to ask everybody to mute please, their uh, microphones because we can hear you. Thank you very much. That would be great. Thank you. Okay. So um, our talk is called Transitions. Um, it's about interventions in historic fabric. Um, and I think uh, the talk today is going to be uh, less of an academic kind of text, but maybe more like a pictorial essay taking you through our work with heritage in rural Norway. Um, hopefully this will be a, a nice piece of escapism since none of us can really travel these days. So I will take you around uh, for a tour of the Norwegian countryside and, um, and some of our projects. Um, what I would like to start off with is showing you some images from the construction process of transforming this historic house. And through this give some background to our title. So our title being Transitions um, plays on how uh, this moment of transition um, that, that we see in our projects when we work with existing buildings, that it is those moments of transitions where inherent value in existing material is revealed. And it is in this moment that the past and the future life of the building overlap. It is when every element uh, in the house is assessed and every intervention must negotiate with what is already there. When an existing building is fully restored, it can be difficult to understand the complexity behind this process. And we just wanted to sort of start by showing some of these images of the building kind of half transformed and the kind of uh, inherent beauty that, uh, that we find in that. There are moments in our pro uh, projects where we actually kind of wish we could sort of stop the process when it's about 75% complete, because that's when um, the projects maybe uh, are most communicative. So we deal mainly in the transformation of existing buildings and places through both our practice and teaching. So we teach at the Oslo School of Architecture and at the Architectural Association in London. Um, we try to run teaching and practice uh, very close. Uh, so projects that are in the uh, office are very related to briefs that we are running uh, in the two schools in London and in Oslo. Uh, one enduring question in the work that we do is how we as architects engage with the notion of the local. And 
how to approach the world of vernacular architecture. Now, vernacular architecture is often described as a kind of the, uh, the building culture, the local building culture without architects, right? So, but as Charles Holland writes very nicely is that vernacular architecture in itself is an oxymoron. It's, um, it's a contradiction in terms, because as soon as we uh, as architects go near the vernacular, we kill it. But in doing so, we make something else. And I think it's that something else that we are very interested in, in our practice and in our teaching. So we lend considerable attention to understanding a place through field work and surveying. And these surveys that we do with uh, both in the practice and in teaching, they don't only quantify physical properties, but also qualified values such as significance, symbolism and local tradition. And I think that was uh, touched upon by the previous speaker, just this, uh, this interest that we have as well that we share about the kind of outsider's gaze, um, about coming from uh, coming from the outside and maybe challenging some of the uh, notions uh, that exist in place of heritage. And we have done so quite actively through uh, running workshops on, on this island that you see here in the picture. We actually have two students here in a boat going out to survey uh, houses and, and areas on, on this island in the North Sea. Um, and it's been a kind of uh, long running interest of us. Uh, and I think that's also interesting uh, myself, I am I am very Norwegian, I would say, although I'm trained in the UK at the AA, um, and my partner Amadine is uh, French American. So, uh, we and when even me being very Norwegian, when I come to a place like this that is uh, in a different region uh, of Norway, uh, it's often uh, quite different um, uh, ideas about these places than than what we have. So, bringing that outsider's gaze, I think, is is important. Some of the survey work that we do is fairly conventional, like this, uh, in the sense that they record tectonic compositions, they record buildings as they are, uh, local vernacular buildings. Um, this one is on, on this island. But it's a process that allows us to gather, uh, so gathering fragments that uh, is needed to understand the, the project as a whole or, or the place as a whole. Um, following, uh, this is student work from uh, a few years ago uh, on this island. Um, where you can see a student gathering uh, generations of ad hoc constructions built from necessity and local resourcefulness. So we often want to look at not only the, the buildings that are considered to be of a kind of heritage uh, status or to be uh, of importance, but also look at all the maintenance and all the systems around it. So in any place you go to, there is not a singular way of building. And it is this diversity of approaches that interests us. When we work with the students, they produce these shop drawings that are based on their initial surveys of existing houses. Um, these are uh, a shop drawing typically is drawn to explain a fabrication or insulation of an item to a manufacturer. Um, in our case, it kind of serves to focus the inquiry. Uh, so when you're analyzing an existing building, we, we tell the students to really zoom in on the moment in that building that is maybe uh, most uh, important or, or says the most about how that building is put together or used. These surveys are then translated into built form uh, in the form of these uh, fragmented artifact models, uh, which are freestanding bricolages of materials that in themselves suggest something more than the sum of their parts. They tend to be quite large and uh, in this case, very, very heavy. You can hardly move it concrete. Um, the objective for these, um, this model is to create something new out of what already exists. So these um, artifact models are material manifestations of essential moments found in the analysis of an existing building. That selective process permits the maker to have an artistic license over the reproduction. The original is not a prescriptive tool, but rather a source of inspiration for new designs. So this is part of a proposal that led, uh, that sort of was uh, extracted, I would say, from, from the previous analysis and surveys. So for us, the underlying uh, question here is really um, the following. How should we as, the, as architects design new forms within historic environments? And what I'll do now is just explain a few uh, examples from the practice. Um, so we run a fairly small operation here in Norway, dealing mostly with existing buildings uh, in timber. Um, and we try, but what we try to do in these uh, small projects is to 
to follow a kind of method. And I'll try to explain uh, that as we go along. Uh, the first project is an extension and refurbishment of a 19th century manor house situated here on the south coast of Norway, across from Denmark and Sweden. It's on an island um, called Linger. Um, it's a very protected island. It has a village here in the center that is very well preserved, um, 19th century merchant village, uh, very close connected to, to London and to Amsterdam and to Stockholm more than, than the rest of the country really, um, and is now being considered as a UNESCO World Heritage Site, although that process is very long and has hardly begun. Um, it is free of cars and, and very much protected by strict heritage regulations, which I think is a common denominator for all our projects, really. This is the estate that we have been working with um, since 2015, um, completed these projects uh, in 2018 and 17. Um, it's called Dr. Gorn, uh, consisting of a number of buildings, a boathouse, a manor house, a storehouse, and a barn. And I, I think this image very much sort of uh, sums up the complexities that we're dealing with in these kind of projects, because these are ornamental frames that were picked apart from the house. Um, and when we were trying to reassemble them, we were trying to gauge like from what, which period is this, from which kind of classicism is this. And as you know, classicism sort of keeps reappearing throughout history. So we didn't know if these were actually um, from the 1850s when the building was built or if they were from the kind of 1950s classicism or 1980s classicism. Um, in fact, they were from all those three periods. Um, and, and, but the, again, their origin of these ornaments lie much further back in time. They were of course derived from, from Greek temples originally. Um, and those temples themselves were built in timber um, before their construction was translated into stone. And then we find it quite interesting when we're putting this house back together again, because now we have those original ornaments back in timber uh, on a house in Norway. The pieces, um, they are a part of a large manor house. Um, its typology is called Sörlandshus, which is a southern classic house. Um, it's a building that through our investigation and our work with it, both with students of surveying it, uh, but also working with it as architects and transformation, it kind of revealed a, a curious typology that defies typical distinction between local vernacular and high architecture. The house is a result of the evolution of a type from the medieval log box in the top left-hand corner, which was the most common house typology in Norway in the 12th century. Uh, made of uh, notched log timbers. You can see the, the length of the timber here. Um, and to the uh, symmetrical Midgangshus, the middle aisle house at the bottom right hand corner. Uh, so it's a vernacular uh, construction that is adapted over time to its local setting. However, it is also heavily influenced by external impulses, um, by global impulses of fashion and style. So this place like I said earlier, it's very closely connected to the shipping lanes of, of Europe. Hence, these ideas come uh, with merchants from uh, around the world. And, and we know for a fact that uh, Palladio uh, was important here, uh, although uh, much later than the rest of Europe, um, and then kind of merges with the local vernacular and the materiality of that. Um, so the Sörlands Hus as a type is, is very much a kind of constructed one. Um, is one of our favorite uh, different methods of drawings, different modes of representation, but really speaks of, of this house as a, as a result of a blend of influences, which is what makes these houses interesting for us beyond uh, how they're normally treated as kind of the romantic or pastiche um, Kind of buildings that are uh, unique expressions of a, some kind of local genus loci. It's much robust frameworks that are made to evolve and absorb new use. So, with that in mind, um, work on the trans. Oh, I think our speaker has disappeared. Oh, I hope we come back. Uh, meantime, uh... We feel the, the screen. Uh, 
just some um Ireland. you're back yeah. okay great it's there um, so we have to I guess we need to give him a minute or so. Maybe I have to assign him as a host. A host. I think it was just a connection problem. No. But hopefully. Let's see what's happening. Oh. Hi. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Nice to, meet you, uh, nice to meet you, Nice to meet Thank you so much for the invitation. Um, Erlen's just logging back in, so he's coming back. Uh, okay. There was maybe. Yeah, there he is. Oh, <laughs> oh there he is. Okay. Um, was it was a good uh, thing to see you anyway? Yes, uh, no so I, I would love I'd love to be there to okay. talk to him, but I will try um, to. Uh, can you join hear me now? Yes, we hear you. Yeah. Okay, good. Sorry about that. Uh, we have some problems with the internet here. Um, let me see if I can pick it back up again. One second. Perfect. That yeah. works. Okay. Um, all right. Um, I'm not quite sure how long I was gone and how long I was speaking to to the void, but. Uh, we, I think the last slide that we did see was the one that had this one was the last slide. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. I'll try to pick it up from there. Um, okay. Um, so this drawing, um, fear of repeating myself, but uh, this drawing is, I think, is is our our one of our favorite drawings, um, and it it's uh, depicting one of these southern classical houses and. I think what it does quite successfully is show how these types of houses are in fact um, a kind of uh, constructed type. So it is consisting, uh, it's a kind of result of, of many influences, which is what makes historical prestige romanticism or sentiment. So when we are looking at these houses, we see not a static type, not something that is a kind of a unique expressions of the local uh, genus loci, but more as robust structures made to evolve and absorb new use. So I think that's the sort of background that we worked with uh, on this project, kind of understanding them as, as this, um, also throughout the process of, of rebuilding them. So uh, we were asked by the, by the house owners to, to uh, renovate these houses that were in quite bad shape. Um, they have been uh, modified a lot over the years. Um, and here you can see the estate, you can see the storehouse on the left hand side and the main manor house on the right hand side. It is called the doctor's farm uh, because this was the where the local doctor on the island uh, was living and working uh, from this house. Um, built in 1850, it was built on the remnants of a house that was there before and it actually uh, uh, was sort of taken apart and reassembled. worked on the project we were uh, asked by our clients to to kind of reconfigure the house to a certain extent um, to tie the different buildings together and to re-establish this central axis that is very essential to this typology um, so we created a new courtyard here um, at the top um, that ties sort of or gives uh, the two houses uh, a shared uh, communal space um, and then we worked on on the plan itself um, of the main house. So here you can see it's a fairly typical example of this middle aisle house. Uh, usually they're fairly symmetrical. They have these two sort of uh, formal rooms in the front uh, and then the back of house where, um, where cooking and so forth uh, happens. And then this extension that was built in 1980 um, quite awkwardly on, on the house. So we were tasked to, to make something uh, that allowed for larger groups to, to use the house, um, but also uh, at times uh, smaller groups of families. So we looked at uh, how can we, from the existing plan, you can see how 
this extension is kind of cutting off this middle aisle of the house. Uh, on, in our proposal, we wanted to, to open that up with a large window out to the courtyard in the back and to reestablish a strong axis throughout the house. And then also to have two kind of pivots on either side of the plan. One is a, a large kitchen that was moved from the other side of the house to here. Uh, so a large kitchen island with built-in cupboards and on the other side, a fireplace that was um, sort of, if you see the existing plan, it was liberated from uh, the walls and created into this sort of freestanding element. This is that uh, fireplace. Um, the, the fireplace or the hearth uh, as a mass, it, it's, it occupies a very central position in the, in the development of vernacular architecture in Norway for very obvious reasons, because it's very cold, right? So the fireplace, both as a sort of structural device, but also as where you're cooking and where you have a heat source is, is, uh, is really driving that development. Um, and it has been very important in the development of these types of houses. Uh, the fireplace, uh, as you can see in this reference image, is where you do your cooking, it's where you do your cleaning, it's also where you can sleep, and it's a kind of central node in, in the buildings. When we started on the house, this hearth was obscured by layers of plasterboard and services, and it was embedded into the log walls of the house. Inside was a collapsed baker oven beyond repair and a chimney that was leaking badly. Half of the hearth is as found, so we used uh, the the existing structure but um, and half of it is kind of recreated using uh, pieces from the building and from the local uh, area. When we stripped out uh, the, uh, the the walls around we got this sort of uh, free uh, standing piece, um, a mass of stone and masonry, uh, freestanding element in the room. And uh, throughout this process, we did a lot of uh, traveling and research, looking at uh, different elements of local vernacular. And we found uh, these things that are very uh, common in Norway. They're across in many, uh, many houses that we saw. They are uh, plates, uh, cast iron plates on, on wood stoves uh, with often with uh, landscapes or biblical scenes. And we wanted to incorporate this into the work that we were doing. So we were looking at how to create a new fireplace in this, uh, in this mass of stone. And um, we started drawing this uh, drawing that you see on the bottom of, of the rough sea outside of the island. That drawing you can see at the top here was then transferred as into a kind of three-dimensional piece by wood carver. Before it was cast in cast iron uh, in the local uh, iron foundry. Um, it was a very, a very heavy piece of kit, um, which was then built into the, to the wall. And the arch here of the fireplace is the same arch as the, as the baker oven that used to be inside. So it's sort of trying to work with the resonance of, of the past whilst giving it a new, new use. We also quite like the idea that the, that the water is here in a kind of cast iron shape and playing on that kind of materiality. As we kind of started to carve this piece out of, of the house, we saw a number of like uh, profiles and, and, and facets that, that weren't visible before. So, so it is a kind of sculptural piece. So just to summarize a little bit about what was guiding us here is, is um, we're, we're trying to find a material logic or an, or an ethos that resonates with the way that that building had originally been built. But at the same time, we're trying to uh, to create a, a new piece of architecture that resonates with the past. And of course, we're working in very strict heritage regulations. So trying to, it's a lot about trying to sneak in a piece of, of, of architecture um, into this setting. Um, another house on the same site that I will uh, show you is a smaller and a much older structure uh, dated to around 1750. It is this building, um, it's called Brigerhus in Norwegian. It's where you would have your auxiliary facilities such as uh, you know, extra bedrooms, cleaning and cooking, um, servicing the major house that you see on the, on the right hand. When we uh, started working on the house, it was not habitable and had been mainly used for storage over the last decades. What we did was to upgrade the building to be fit for all year habitation. So uh, insulation is a big, part in Norway. Um, I, I do get jealous when I see projects from Bahrain that doesn't have to deal with minus 
25 degrees and, and, uh, and hail. But um, this is a big part of what we do with these old buildings. They have to be put up to a sort of standard in the code. Um, and they also have to be kitted out with uh, elements that allow for contemporary use. So the way we often work is we think of our intervention as a kind of new lining on the inside of the, of the project. So it is a new lining that, that allows for that building to, to survive in a way because it's upgrading it without uh, interfering too much maybe with the tectonics of the building, um, but gives all these services such as um, you can see here on the left hand side, uh, a fireplace, um, storage, uh, shelving, um, and uh, a, a window, a picture window out on the back that gives you uh, new views of the of the sky and, and the hill and the rock side uh, in the back and, uh, and the day bed, uh, bookshelves and storage, and a kitchen uh, with a kitchen counter uh, and a window on the top framing the bedrock outside. So this is kind of one continuous piece of furniture that is inserted into, into this fabric. The fireplace uh, is uh, is a fairly uh, regular uh, kind of material. It's a uh, brick uh, rendered, and we were asked by the client here to um, to to do something that's related to to local customs without uh, basically spending too much money because the same clients as the previous house. So I think we had we had spent enough. But uh, what was interesting is that um, there is a long tradition for these types of um, uh, decor in, in Norwegian houses. Uh, this one is called stank decor. It's, it's mimicking terrazzo basically. Uh, it was often used when the real material was too expensive um, and has that long uh, history in, in Norwegian vernacular. Uh, what you do is you use the colors of the rest of the room and you mix that and you spray it on the wall. So and you do that through using uh, twigs and shrubbery from um, from the hillside behind the house. Uh, we did this at the very end of the project. We actually did this ourselves. Um, had to cover up the rest of the house and, and, and apply this, this paint. Um, we also did the same thing on the upstairs level uh, where you can see that this is actually a sort of a fairly cheap industrial product, the, the plate behind the, the fireplace, but it's treated with the same kind of decor as you can see here, with the colors from, from the room itself and the rest of the room. And then the next project I would like to show is um, the transformation of a coastal barn from agricultural use to domestic use. It's this building here, um, uh, a quite uh, unspectacular uh, building, but one um, that is now, uh, is a, represents a type that is under threat along the coast of Norway. Um, this is due to the fact that uh, in Norway, uh, the primary kind of industries of farming and fishing are kind of receding from these uh, areas and, and being replaced by much more leisure. So a lot of these barns are being uh, either uh, demolished or, or uh, changed sort of uh, to, to become quite unrecognizable. This one is from 1850, we believe. Um, it's quite a simple but sophisticated construction. Uh, it has this notched log box sitting on top of a uh, timber, uh, no, sitting on top of the stone wall, sorry, um, with a timber roof structure clad in roof tiles uh, on the top. As you can see here in the existing plan, it shows two fairly equal rooms. To the left is the hay drying area and timber stud work, and to the right, an animal pen that's made of traditional stone wall in order to insulate the livestock from the harsh climate. These stones were actually quarried from the bedrock directly behind the building. In our proposal, so going from existing to proposed, we, uh, we were tasked again to transform this building into a dwelling. Um, so we looked at how we could uh, add kitchen, living room, bedrooms and baths in the building that had previously been occupied by animals. Um, so the main driver of this plan is the idea of how to compress again the new domestic services so that we can retain some of the original spaces. So in here is a new kitchen. Um, there is a stair going up, which is combined with a fireplace, a day bed and more storage along these kind of axes or back of the project. And then in here, that used to be the manure uh, area and the, and, the, and the lavatories for the, for the people. Uh, there's the bathroom and bedroom, and then there's another bedroom above. 
So uh, some of the typical challenges we face when transforming a building um, or changing its use is, is that uh, the domestic uh, client requires, of course, more light. Um, so we saw here to, to strike a balance There are very strict regulations here in place for changing a lot of negotiation with uh, the statutory um, planning officer. So existing of openings in the buildings have uh, that were originally used to bring in animals and hay do now bring in light uh, for the clients. Um, and we tried here that new windows would would differentiate differentiate themselves from the old uh, by being more sort of abstracted cuts in the in the fabric. Such as this one that actually reflects the landscape around it, um, but differs from the uh, traditional windows, uh, hand the new window uh, for, for new use. Going from the outside and into the building, um, we do this very often. We work with uh, large uh, physical models um, uh, in scale, often at 1 to 20, for example. And we do that to uh, to make a model that is both uh, kind of interactive for us as a working model. Um, it needs to be kind of you need to be able to open it up uh, and to uh, to to look inside. Uh, so it becomes a tool both for us when we're working, but also for um, presenting to the client. So when we work inside the building, there are moments where a piece of existing fabric is missing uh, that we see opportunities to insert new elements into the building. Uh, and what happened here is that the, there was a stone wall in this area before that had collapsed, was removed, um, and we saw that as an opportunity to put in a new piece. Um, the client wishes for a fireplace uh, was very strong and we, we looked at how can we find again this kind of uh, precedence in, in some of the um, vernacular studies that we had. So um, rather than making it a feature in the room, we chose to sort of look at how can these things be incorporated into the kind of uh, existing walls and, and structures. So what we have uh, developed here is a fireplace that sits in place of the old stone wall. Um, it's a bulky mass of masonry and stone that make up this fireplace. Uh, and we wanted here to kind of leave one stone in place to act as both structural support for that fireplace, but also as a kind of object as found, um, as a kind of memory of that stone wall that was there. Um, the fireplace uh, has storage for firewood, but it's also a stair. So we're trying to compress these functions into very small um, pieces so that we can retain other spaces in the building. And then we work with with models again. This is a one to ten uh, model uh, where we look, we kind of take a piece of the building out of its context and start to to look at it in a isolation. And that allows us to carry out a more sort of precise fine tuning of the element in, in model scale. So what we're trying to do is, is use the kind of need for repair or or where someone something has to be replaced or altered. Um, to, to find moments to basically kind of sneak in uh, a bit of, uh, of architecture into this fabric so that we uh, adapt this space for, for new use. Um, I will just carry on to, through some a couple of more projects um, that highlight uh, different ways of working. Um, this one is connecting and refurbishing two historic houses um, and making a and a connecting piece in between, uh, so weaving with a new thread. It's located here close to the Swedish border um, along the coast of Norway. In this village, um, uh, that is a village of some historical importance, um, it's a kind of uh, trading place next to a river. It's a, quite a, a tight site. You can see here the, the site in question, very steep. Um, and very uh, protected. So this is a project that we have submitted for planning quite recently, it's not built, um, but we wanted to talk about it because uh, for us it represents a very interesting case study. Um, the houses that you can see here on the hill, uh, the two houses of the, of the project, they are um, fairly typical representatives of a, a style that was prevalent in Norway in the late 19th century. 
and I thought it'd be funny to 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 mention this day because they're actually called Schweizer Stil, so Swiss style, um, which um, is quite peculiar and actually kind of a misnomer. Um, I don't know if any of the Swiss audience feels that this is very Swiss, but <laughs> um, it's uh, it's in English it's called as a Swiss chalet style um, in Norwegian Schweizer Stil. It quickly becomes a dominant style within the domestic house market in Norway. Um, it's its appeal, I think, and later kind of tweaked iteration of this style um, takes on actually a kind of national romantic significance in Norway. Um, becomes a very popular building style. Um, it is uh, a timber architecture, highly ornate, um, big uh, roof eaves, projecting roofs and so forth. And I think the idea here is that, uh, that it actually came from Germany, from the Berlin School of Architecture but again, looked at uh, kind of Italian uh, villages and somehow this has led to them being called Swiss. <laughs> but um, it's a kind of misnomer. I don't know exactly why. And I think uh, no one has really found out, but uh, uh, Swiss style in Norway, Swiss style is kind of synonymous with, with a period in history where Norway is seeking independence and this somehow becomes a kind of national romantic style. It is very, very different from the uh, buildings that predates it, uh, the domestic buildings. It is extremely ornate. Um, these details are very different from the from the more sober classicism that predates it. Um, it's called Snekkerglede in Norwegian, which calls carpenter's joy. Um, so lots and lots of carvings. Um, and um, one can ask why this style became so dominant in Norway. And the answer that we found is that it, it, it has to do with the Industrial Revolution, actually. Um, and the Norwegian topography meant historically that large parts of the country were inaccessible by land. So the shipping routes were, were very, very important along the coast, um, as we explained in the previous project, how ideas arrived to these islands. But when the railroad started being built uh, in the later half of the 19th century, that really changed its dynamics. So you started getting these railroads going through the valleys and, and to the different cities. And Norway is, has a much more dense population on, in the east part, on the right-hand side of this map. Um, and the railroad worked as conduits from, from that area into the, to the countryside. And with that brought ideas, basically, and, and trends. They did so through uh, that a lot of the stations along these conduits were built in, in the dominant style of the time in the Sveitsche Stil. So they, the, the train stations were built uh, like this one. Um, and that was then kind of made, a, a, I guess, a big impression on, on the countryside and became very dominant. And uh, in some sense, this is kind of early examples of, of centralized uh, modernism uh, appearing in the countryside. And what's even more interesting is to find that these houses were often prefabricated. Uh, so you've got prefabricated Swiss style houses. And um, this is a brochure actually selling those prefabricated houses uh, in the 1890s. Um, and uh, as a curious detail here, you can see the kind of uh, uh, design of this brochure is kind of playing on the uh, state churches of Norway. So it has a kind of national um, uh, identity uh, embedded into it. The houses were built in this factory uh, near Oslo and then exported across uh, Norway uh, on the railroads. And it was also exported to, to around the world because what you get with these kind of template houses is a modular construction, the, the notched log construction, allows you to, to, to make it in the factory and then to reassemble it uh, anywhere in the world. And there are actually, bizarrely enough, examples of these buildings in India, in, in South Africa, uh, other places in Africa and, and North America. So Norway was exporting Swiss style houses, which starts gets very complicated. <laughs> um, we've been looking at these kind of intricate manufacturing templates for a while. Um, that's been very interesting for us. And to, to, uh, to go back on a big loop, but to go back to this project, uh, we were, we were looking at this and seeing how some of this historical research could, uh, aid us in, in the development of this design. So we had to convince local uh, authorities and, and we're still waiting for that response, but to, to see that we are doing something that resonates not only with the place itself, but with the history of that type of house. 
So the intentions of the clients here was to connect two main buildings on a site without disturbing a lush garden that they sit in, as well as connecting kind of circulation on site. Um, so the extension that we propose, as well as a refurbishment of these two houses, they um, negotiate both the change in direction, um, the geometry of these two houses uh, here, but also a change in height. They also add uh, sanitary uh, functions and storage for this, for this family. Our proposal is attempting to negotiate that difference in geometry uh, by stepping the datum that uh, is very typical for these Swiss houses that they split the paneling with a kind of uh, molding here. Um, so it's stepping that up and connecting to the next building um, and kind of mediating the difference between these two houses. We sought to express the structure um, as we wanted the building to resonate with the Swiss style without directly copying it as a kind of pastiche move. In addition to that, uh, to that expression of structure, uh, the building also uh, goes between uh, masking out the nature behind, whilst also sort of framing it. So rather than creating a kind of very ornamental screen like the Swiss style tends to do, we kind of allow the nature to, to be that ornament on this site. So that building is essentially a bridge. It's a covered walkway uh, elevated above the ground, uh, allowing for water and vegetation to roam free in and around the extension. Um, and it's kind of blending or resonating with, with the existing building in the background. As a tectonic principle, we looked at uh, building something that had a very light footprint on site uh, that could be easily manufactured off site, so prefabricated, like, like in that long kind of actually now 130 year old history of, of the Swiss houses. Um, prefabricated with short construction spans and minimum disruption to the site. The load carrying columns are placed on the outside for allowing that uh, to take the load bearing to take a kind of active part in the view of the building. So through those moves, the, uh, the qualities of the lush garden outside is brought in to the daily life of the house. Um, internal spaces like these lined with alternating wall sections and large glass panes that provides views out to the garden and the view beyond. It generates a number of views and kind of framed uh, moments uh, where you glimpse how the new building is interacting with the landscape, but also how it interacts with certain properties of, of the existing buildings. So uh, finally, I would like to end on uh, another transformation project. This is quite different from the others. It's uh, the most public project we have to date. It's on site now. Um, and it's a, a transformation of a large barn from production of food to the production of art. It's situated here. We're now in the middle of Norway uh, along the biggest lake. Uh, it's an area known for farming output for, um, for big uh, landscapes. And the barn that we're working with is part of this farmstead that contains the Balke Center, uh, which is a cultural center dedicated to the work and the legacy of the Norwegian painter Peter Balke. So the barn is uh, at the bottom here, the number three, um, a manor house from uh, 18th century there with a the classical garden. It's all this kind of ensemble, but it has been an, an active farm uh, in the past. Uh, right now, the, this barn is only partly functioning as an agricultural structure, but it has been identified by this cultural center as a building that they would like to use for their activities. These barns are very interesting. If you've ever traveled around in Norway, you, you might have seen this, or if you fly into Oslo, you'll see these red barns. They are dotted across the entire landscape, a very sort of iconic presence. Their origins are is very interesting because they were basically uh, made as a consequence of agricultural reforms in the 19th century. So uh, as land was consolidated from a kind of medieval structure in Norway uh, into a kind of more modern rationalized farming, these were the architectural responses to that reform. So it was about uh, gathering all the functions of the farm under one uh, roof rather than in, in various buildings. So just to emphasize, they made these template drawings centrally uh, in the farming kind of uh, department and sent it out to the country. And it's like, this is how you, you build an effective farm. Uh, before that, you had these small log buildings where you know all, all the different functions were, were spread. Um, 
So those template drawings then get kind of a, adapted to the different regions. Uh, in Norway, we have very different topographies, uh, dialects, um, and building cultures. So they they are sort of mass produced, but also adapted to local context and, and also built with locally sourced materials. So you can see the kind of variation of them across the country, but based on the same principles. They are large scale buildings only matched by uh, religious and industrial buildings. And over time, these uh, buildings have been adapted. Um, this is work we did with, with students in Oslo, uh, mapping out uh, lots of different farms in this region uh, and how they have adapted their buildings. Uh, but unfortunately, a lot of them are obsolete, meaning that they are uh, no longer fit for their original purpose. Um, the farming sector in Norway is, is very small. It's actually 1% of GDP. Even if there's farms everywhere, uh, it's kind of being kept artificially alive, uh, which is a long history. Uh, but uh, it's interesting in the context of this uh, study because one uh, thinks that maybe around 30,000 farms in Norway are no longer uh, in their original use. These buildings are very interesting for us because they, are, uh, they have a sophisticated internal system. They receive the crops on this uh, barn bridge, um, so the hay from the fields, where it gets deposited onto this uh, barn bridge um, before it gets dropped into this hayloft where it dries off and it's kind of a cool, dark space before the hay is then pushed down to the animals below and then the manure in that basement is put back onto the field. So it's a part, they are very much a part of the uh, cyclical nature that surrounds them. With our students in Oslo, we did a 3D scan of this uh, building, um, which was very, very interesting for us because of course it shows it gave us a very uh, good foundation for working with the building, uh, showed us its kind of tectonic uh, principles, but also it showed us what it contains. And that, that was the biggest discovery for us, I think, uh, that actually these barns are far from uh, uh, empty vessels uh, when they're no longer used. They're full of stuff, basically. Um, they are uh, cabinets of curiosities uh, and, and, and full of whatever had to be stored on the farm. So they're quite amazing worlds to, to be in. Um, I'll show you a couple of photos from the inside here. They're called, in Norway, they're called the kind of cathedrals of the countryside because they have this, this quite grand constructions, um, but also a number of technologies that are obsolete or active or rejigged for new use. Um, and this is in the animal pen where it's more of a concrete and brick world and from the area. So our task was to find a way to, to transform this building from a, an ag agricultural machine that was quite inward looking to a public building basically for production and exhibition of art. Uh, our proposed interventions are um, a set of simple stair cores, their cut openings, apertures. We try to work in a kind of surgical way to, to unclog these arteries uh, of, the, of the building. The current situation in the building means that most rooms are accessed independently of one another, um, various degrees of insulation. And our proposal then inserts a number of, of public functions into the buildings. So um, sanitary facilities, kitchens, studios, uh, workspaces and, and exhibition rooms, uh, as well as the aim on the long run is to make this uh, a universally accessed uh, building, so up to, 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 to code, which is a very challenging thing in a, in a building like this. So when we worked in order to fully understand um, this building, uh, we, uh, we started building a, a model of uh, at scale one to 20, where it got almost too big for our little office. Um, and we, we do this to understand the complexities involved uh, and to understand the different spaces, especially here where uh, you have a lot of vertical and sort of diagonal connections throughout the building. This, these models are important for us because they are both working models, but also kind of presentation models. It's where we draw out all our uh, visuals, um, perspectives and so forth. We don't really do renderings in our projects. We do, do model photos and um, use that to explain the project. And I think that's kind of relevant maybe for the topic of this conference that um, when you work with, with heritage uh, and you are proposing changes, you need to 
convince not just your client, you need to convince stakeholders, you need to convince uh, the public in this case that are paying for this building. Um, and you have in a way many sets of clients and, and we tend to say that that may be the building as well as, as, as one of those clients that we, that we try to, uh, to find a way to adapt it. Um, and and, and it's, in this sense, the model is, is very efficient for us. Um, to preserve the existing construction in this building, we, we, uh, we looked here at two different wall uh, details. The, our one, the one on the left is existing and the right is proposed. What we wanted to do is create a new lining on the inside that allowed for the previous wall to, to stand and to be framed by the new wall. Um, when the new wall is then made of a kind of industrial, locally produced uh, in aluminium, most likely. Um, and here you can see the cross section that on the left, you have the existing horse stables with spaces open to the barn bridge above. And on the right is a large room used for storing tractors. That was added more uh, recently. And when we work with these existing buildings, we try to see if there is kind of a latent uh, potential in some of these spaces. And, and so we really kind of um, interview the building. Um, in this case, we placed the, the main uh, kind of entrance area in where the old stables were, where we had that vertical connection. Um, we now put in uh, a new uh, piece of architecture that allows for that circulation to take place. It's a lobby and a stairwell leading you to the different floors of the building. That stair core in itself becomes a kind of object in that double height space. So here you can see the stair core pushing through the different floors of the building. It's for us, we try to think of it as a kind of piece of agricultural machinery that is, is put into this building. And as one ventures up to the top floor, the stair cores, they deliver uh, visitors to this existing barn bridge. The materials in the projects are industrial as we consider these buildings to be uh, more industrial than, than, than kind of uh, vernacular in a sense and try to withhold those impulses for a traditional craft in this project. What we really hope to achieve is something kind of like this, where you see from another barn that that's how these barns are, are updated. They, uh, they make this kind of weave um, where uh, technology from the ages have been evolving into the fabric of the building itself. And you have obsolete and active technology kind of side by side. And uh, contemporary farming equipment looks kind of like this. It's, it's a very high tech world, um, very functional kit of parts that are inserted into the building. So this is not our proposal, but, but a sort of reference of material. Because that's often our biggest challenge in these projects. How do we add contemporary services for allowing for that new use to take place, whilst also kind of retain some, some of the older obsolete uh, technology that speaks of that building's past use. So we're now very happy that the first phase of this project is more or less complete. Uh, at one end of the building, we have inserted these uh, these openings, and uh, we have opened up uh, old windows and, and inserted services such as heating and, and lighting and uh, and so forth. Um, so it's now a space used for a sculpture um, and he needs it's kind of interesting because his process is quite industrial he needs uh, cars to be able to drive into space to deposit material and to pick up pieces of arch um, so it's kind of carrying on this industrial uh, aesthetic with the exterior of the building uh, we hope to retain some of the original character the the kind of uh, uh, palimpsest like skin of this building that shows you all the, the, the traces of past use. Uh, but of course, it has to be opened up to the outside uh, and to communicate a very public program. So I will end on this uh, slide um, of us driving off with our barn in the back. Uh, this is our traveling roadshow. Um, we'd like to say something about about how we work uh, and, and, and the importance of this. We, we do think that there is a rich opportunity um, in our field to take stock of existing values and qualities, uh, which is something we do with heavy involvement on site, uh, both in practice and with the studios. So we embed ourselves in a place to, to understand it. Um, 
also to, to, to challenge some of the preconceived notions of heritage that exist in a place. Um, we are trying to, to learn and teach uh, that maybe the most important thing we do as architects is to work with the buildings that we already have. Um, and one of our previous tutors at the AA in London, Irene S. Galbert, wrote a very beautiful sentence that I would like to end on, that architecture involves some detective work. You look at things, you look under things and through things, because they are a source of knowledge and signs of momentary resourcefulness. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to invite Elisabetta Kirikun to ask you a question. And uh, while Elisabetta is coming in, I would like to call the attention of everybody to our Q&A box, where you can drop questions to our panelists during the day. There is a question also for you, um, but we will start with Elisabetta. Uh, hello, uh, Arvind and Amandine. I'm Elisa. I'm your interviewer for today. Uh, thank you, first of all, for your uh, insightful presentation. We've seen some fascinating hand-drawn drawings and uh, models. And I would like to move to my first question. And I've noticed a lot of um, deconstruction, repurposing, and recycling in your work. And I'm wondering if whether the digital tools that appeared in the market in the past 10 years have been uh, useful for you in any way in your approach. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, it has uh, very much so. Although I don't think we um, we don't limit ourselves to to sort of one medium. Uh, I think that that uh, different um, modes of surveying and recording the existing environment are still all relevant. Um, we have been using 3D scanning a lot, but we find that um, it's quite important to uh, introduce our students and also the way we work ourselves in the practice to a, a number of types of surveys. Uh, so the survey doesn't only kind of record um, a, a space such as a, a digital survey does, but uh, you should also be able to work differently with interrogating a place and what that place means to people. So I think that the, that the medium itself is not important per se, but that the, um, maybe the, uh, the, 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 the outcome, the sort of sum of what you record and how your attitudes are for, for recording. So uh, there, are, uh, there is a lot of, of new interesting technologies that of course inform this process. Um, but at the end of the day, we believe that there are, there are tools maybe uh, that help us, um, but that, uh, that to keep a kind of, um, to keep even very uh, old or um, obsolete ways of, of, of serving alive is, is, has a value. Um, because it, 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 um, it's better to have a number of different techniques and then to try and conclude from what they give you as a sort of total sum rather than uh, rather than depend on, on one, uh, I would say. So I don't know if that really answers your questions, but 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 yes, it has informed uh, the way we work and, and uh, it is of interest to us. Because we are running already quite late on our program, I'm going to have to ask you to just please ask the question that we have on the Q&A so that we can move on to our next presenter and still be relatively on schedule. Could you ask the question that was dropped in the Q&A, Elisabetta? Yes, uh, it was already partially answered by one of the panelists, but just to make sure, um, the drawings that you were showing, uh, are they all made by your studio? Or if not, uh, can we have some uh, information about where they're, where they're coming from? Um, yes, yeah, so we have tried to, to text that on the slides, but, but um, I would say that the, in the beginning of the of the lecture, we showed some some student work um, made by uh, by students of ours in in Oslo. Um, and uh, but what we try to do is uh, so so the rest of the presentation is mainly I think only our work more or less. Uh, but um, what we try to do is is uh, to work very closely with our students. So they're not involved necessarily in, in, the, in the proposals that we do in the office, but uh, we like to, to involve them in the kind of uh, survey phase of projects um, so that they can see that 
the tasks that they perform are relevant for practice. And that's important for us to show that they are not uh, exercises uh, outside of the, of the of the discipline of, of, or the professional discipline. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Okay, okay. Nobuyoshi, could you mute yourself, please? We can hear you laughing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Erland. And I'm really sorry, I would love to hear Elisabetta's next questions, but unfortunately, we have to move on to our next. So okay. I thank you very much for your time for the presentation. Thank you so much for the invite, for having me. Thank you. So we'll move right on.